So this is on page, it's gonna start on page 68 of Kittel and Cromer. Okay, so consider our system. Remember that this is a, an open system. This is the reservoir and is comparatively huge. And over here we have our system and it is comparatively tiny. Okay, so if we control the temperature of the reservoir, because they are in, in thermal contact and in thermal uh, equilibrium, then the temperature of the reservoir is going to be the same as the temperature of the system. Okay, so before we saw a system, you know, in order to derive the, the Boltzmann factor, we looked at a system that only had two states. So, you know, very, very small. Uh, this other system that we're going to consider um, is much bigger, you know, has a very large number of, of energy states, so many that they're very close together in energy. But still, you know, the reservoir is much bigger. You can always find uh, a reservoir that is big enough, so that's a good thing. Okay, so... The probability, you're gonna have two probability distributions for this situation. So this is gonna be your energy axis. Uh, I'm gonna use e, uh, e, although probably I should call it u, but let's stick with that. So this is your probability. The uh, Boltzmann factor How did it look, the Boltzmann distribution, sorry, or yeah, I guess in this case, Boltzmann factor. You remember? Yeah, e to the negative. negative. So it looks kind of like this, right? So e to the minus uh, the energy divided by the temperature. So by changing the temperature, which in this case is a parameter, and this is like the it's a function of the energy with a parameter temperature, you could change the shape of this of this curve. So it could look like all of it is at zero if the temperature is really low, or it could be almost like uniform if the temperature is really high. But for most you know, normal cases, it's going to be in between and it's gonna look like that. Okay, so this one, it gives you the, the energy. Okay, and the energy uh, always tries to be in the lower energy state. You have learned that in your classes. And so that's why you have more energy over here, a more uh, higher probability of being in a lower energy state than, uh, than in a higher energy state. Yes, you have some probability of being in a higher energy state. Um, what other color do I have? Let's use this one. But there is another probability distribution, uh, which is the, the entropy. You remember how the entropy looks like? It's gonna be E to the sigma. Sigma is the entropy. So it's gonna look like this. Okay, so even though the energy wants to be as low as possible. The entropy needs energy in order to be in a higher entropy state. And so there's this epic fight between the energy that wants to be at a minimum and the entropy, which wants to be 
at a maximum. The result is a curve that, you know, for a very large system, is going to be very narrow. It's going to look like that. Um, you know, this is going to look a little bit like a Gaussian. Um, maybe I didn't try it like that well over here. It looks like a Gaussian, but it's very, very, very narrow. Okay, so the situation that maximizes the entropy while minimizing the energy is this one. So in your in classical mechanics, uh, most other physics classes that you have taken, the energy goes to the minimum. Over here, you, you're in, in thermodynamics and in reality, you always have this entropic component that once uh, it's going to eat up some of your energy. Okay, so this probability, the, the, the red one, actually, let me use red. It's going to be proportional to the energy term and times the uh, entropic term. So this is equal to exponent of negative one over tau. And then it's going to be the energy minus the entropy times tau. Okay, so you know how this plot looks like, so I'm going to get rid of it. Um, if we want to maximize this function, to you know, find at what energy it it has a peak. Then uh, we can just look at this part over here in the exponent. And so to maximize this function, we just have to minimize this part. Okay, so. If we take the, the derivative, it looks a little ugly, the notation here with the E, but it's fine. Make it equal to zero, then you get, you can find what the, um, the energy is uh, of the peak. So you get, Um, I guess you can take the temperature out. You're going to get one minus temperature uh, derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy. That is equal to zero. So I was mentioning that this notation looks a little weird because it's easier to recognize this one when it has the U. If it has the U, um, then this whole thing is going to be the sigma, the U equal one over tau. And we have seen this one before. Where did we see it? In what situation did Was that? Yeah, it was in the second chapter. How did we derive it?
Yeah. So we had a closed system with two subsystems that were in thermal contact and in thermal equilibrium. And this was the definition of temperature. This is the definition of temperature. Um, so the, if they're in thermal equilibrium, the change in entropy with respect to the energy of one system is equal to the change in entropy with respect to the energy of the other system. And so you know, they move back and forth the same amount of heat, and so they, start, they stay in thermal equilibrium. If they're not in thermal equilibrium, then there's more heat flowing in one direction than in the other. This is the same quantity, but we derived it with an open system that is um, in contact with a, with a reservoir. Okay, so even though the definition of the temperature ends up being the same, the interpretation is a little different, right? So um, in this case, the temperature is, is going to define where that peak is located, the, the fight between the energy and the entropy. Okay, so um, this quantity over here, well, this one over here is called the free energy, the Helmholtz free energy. You will see later that there are several different free energies. So this one is the, is the most important one in physics. So it's um, U minus tau sigma. This is uh, equation uh, 3.35. Could you repeat that? Mm, we will we will we will look at it. Um, it is related to work, but it is not work. So mm, okay, I guess I will mention later. So the Helmholtz free energy is typically used more in physics. There's another one that is called the Gibbs free energy that is used more in chemistry, and that is because of the uh, variables that you can typically measure, you know, in, a, in an experiment. Okay, so in your mechanics class, pretty probably in most of your classes, you only care about the energy part. Here, what we really care about is the free energy. So you have the ener the energy component and the entropy component. Okay, so this is more general than what you have seen in, in previous classes. Okay, so let's take a look at this equation. Let's manipulate it a little bit. I'm gonna put it up here. So consider reversible changes. What did we mean by reversible? The change in entropy was zero, right? So you could move along and, and uh, uh, an adiabat or an isentrope. So we're going to change uh, the temperature and the volume. So if this is a free energy, then the derivative of the free energy 
it's going to be the derivative of this. Okay. And so this is going to be du minus uh, tau d sigma minus sigma d tau. All right, so just the product rule over there. So consider first uh, temperature changes, volume remains constant. Uh, we're not going to lose generality, we'll see later why. The thermodynamic identity is I put it over here. Um, tau d sigma is du uh, minus PdV. And this is capital U. PdV. Okay, so this implies that the negative PdV is going to be tau d sigma minus d um, plus du, right? Um, in this particular case, uh, the volume is constant. So dv equals zero. So this whole thing is going to be equal to zero. And then we can uh, rewrite the DF. So the DF as the, with constant volume. Uh, this part over here, du, du. Um, did I miss a negative? Uh, yes. This should be. Minus. Okay. So du du minus t d sigma minus t d sigma. So we can rewrite this whole thing as negative sigma d tau. So this plus this equals zero. Cool. So that is a good relationship to know. So if we move, if we move the d tau over here, we can rewrite this as a partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the temperature at constant volume equals negative sigma. Okay, this is equation 3.49. So let's do the same thing, but now V changes, tau is constant. So we have our minus PDV here again. Okay, so now this is at constant temperature. So now uh, this thing over here, is minus PDV. And this part, because the, the temperature is constant, this is zero, right? So at constant temperature, this is gonna be equal to minus PDV. 
and if we want to write it in partial differential, I mean, in uh, um, yeah, partial differential differential form, the change in the free energy with respect to the volume at constant temperature is equal to minus p. So that is also equation 3.49. That's the other part of equation 3.49. So if we put both of them together, the, the derivative at constant temperature and the derivative at constant volume, we get um, Mm. Oh, I have this one. Minus sigma e tau minus p dv. So that one is equation three point forty eight. Okay, so we learned some properties about, about the free energy. What do they mean? Let's take a look at them. Let's analyze this one first. Changing the free energy with respect to the temperature at constant volume is the change, yeah, is equal to uh, negative entropy. Or and this looks like an ugly entropy. Okay. We have our reservoir and our system. First, we change the temperature of the reservoir. What's gonna happen to the temperature of the system? What is going to be its temperature? So change temperature of the reservoir. Um, system, whoops. Um, system uh, and reservoir are in thermal contact and thermal equilibrium. So temperature of the of the reservoir of the system changes. Sorry, all my markers are okay. Um, is there any work done? No. Why not? The volume is constant, so there is no, no work done. Uh, but is there a heat transfer or an energy transfer? So how come we put energy or take energy out? We put energy into the, the system. It does no work. What happens to that energy? Uh, 
pressure. That is true, yeah. So the insight here, is that you need energy to maintain temperature. So this energy is not done, it's not used to do any work. And you know this is this is one case uh, the with the when the volume is is constant, um, but in general, you know any system is going to be a combination of this one constant volume and the other one constant constant temperature. Okay, uh, you can describe it using those two. So this energy that goes that flows into the system to increase its uh, its temperature is locked in there. You cannot use it to the work. So you pay a penalty tax essentially, you know, like the system is going to want to keep some of that um, for itself, you cannot use it. It's just a consequence of, of uh, them being in thermal equilibrium. So when we talked before about the, the heat death of the universe, that's going to happen when all the energy of the universe, you know, the, the energy is not going to disappear, but all the energy of the universe is going to be locked uh, you know, just to keep the temperature, to maintain the thermal equilibrium um, of the universe. So that's why this is called a free energy, right? You have the regular energy, but it also includes the, the entropic penalty tax. And Alejandro, you mentioned pressure. So let's take a look at that. So the energy, is it the energy to maintain the system in terms of the thermal equilibrium of the full void is like no, that is what? It lost the last part. Well, let's look at the pressure first and then we can talk about that question. So the other one was that the change in the free energy when you change the volume at constant temperature is minus the pressure. Right? So I'm going to draw it a little smaller, but you know what it's supposed to represent. So this is a system. This is the reservoir. So now um, it's easier to imagine that you are compressing this system. So doing work on the system. Um, so the derivatives that we have are derivative with respect to volume of u, so it's a free energy, u minus tau d sigma minus sigma d tau. Uh, if this is at constant temperature, then this one goes away and we have only these two. Okay, so then the pressure um, minus pressure, I guess, is equal to the derivative. Actually, I'm going to put the negative on the other side. Um, minus the derivative of the energy with respect to the volume at constant temperature. And minus and minus plus the derivative, uh, well, the tau 
derivative of sigma with respect to the volume at constant temperature. Okay, so if we change the volume of the system, let's say that we squeeze it, um, the reservoir and the system are in thermal equilibrium. So you know, the temperature has to remain the same. Or this one is down. What's gonna happen to the, to the energy? When you squeeze the system, um, you know, very, very slowly so that it's always in thermal equilibrium. But when you compress the system, the energy, you know, the, the temperature is going to increase. The molecules are going to start um, moving a little bit faster, but because they are in thermal equilibrium with this huge reservoir, uh, that excess energy is just gonna move to the reservoir. Okay, so you squeeze the system, the, the energy goes to the reservoir. If you just grabbed this system, you know, perhaps like a balloon or something, and you just expanded it, then heat will flow into, into the system. Okay, so there are two sources of pressure. This is one, and this is the other one. I'm going to get rid of these. This is called the energy pressure. Which I think you mentioned before, Alejandro. And this is the uh, entropy pressure. So if you had a solid, say that it looks kind of like this. It has some atoms in here, but they are trapped in a lattice. You know, this is a crystal. Um, in a solid, the positions of the atoms are pretty, are pretty, pretty much fixed, right? They can move around the position, but it's a relatively, uh, it's a relatively small change. So the entropy, the entropy part doesn't change as much when you, uh, when you put uh, heat into it, when there's a heat flow. So the pressure is going to be the result of a change in the energy of the particles, right? You, you this is the, the typical solid behavior. You squeeze the solid, uh, these atoms are going to have more kinetic energy. They're going to start vibrating faster, but around the, the same position. If you keep the volume constant, then you know that increased energy is going to increase the pressure. If on the other hand, you have a gas like a balloon and you put um, there's a, a heat flow, you put some energy into the system, then the gases are pretty much free to move you know anywhere they want. So the way they are going to increase the pressure is by increasing their entropy. So increasing you know, the, where they can be. And that's why you know, the, the volume is going to increase while well, here the volume doesn't increase much. So the energy pressure is the main mechanism uh, by which pressure changes in solids. And the entropy pressure is the main mechanism by which entropy ch um, pressure changes in gases. 
Could, could you repeat that? Okay, the imaginative volume is expanding. The volume is expanding, yes. Yes, I understand what you're saying. Mm. I don't think so. I think you, you know, I, I think essentially the situation is um, you put energy into the system. Uh, some of it is going to do work like in general, right? Um, the volume is going to expand. So some of it's going to go to work and the other one, well, the DU, and the other one is going to go to entropy. So it's going to be tau d sigma. But you need to put the energy in there uh, to begin with. So I don't think you can expand it without putting um, energy in there. At least I cannot think of a case in which that would be true. But you know, there's weird things in thermodynamics, maybe like in one dimension, it will happen or something like that. Actually, yeah, I think it might happen in one dimension. So if you look at problem 3.10 in Kittel, force is proportional to the temperature. Force arises because the polymer wants to curl up. The entropy is higher in a random coil than in an uncoiled configuration. So, you know, it might be that case. But I think, you know, for most three dimensional real world applications, um, this, this is true. Okay, so what else? Mm, okay. So just very quickly, minus PDV at constant entropy is the U at constant entropy minus P D V at constant temperature is D F at constant temperature. Okay, so uh, this is the equation that describes what happens in, in a closed system. And this is essentially what you have seen in mechanics, right? So here the pressure is um, dVdU. When the system is open, you have pretty much the same thing, except that instead of the regular energy, you have the free energy. So the free energy plays the role of the energy in open systems. So the other thing that it's important to keep in mind, the second derivative of the free energy, I guess the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the volume and with respect to the temperature is equal to the 
partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the temperature and then with respect to the volume. Right, so partial derivatives commute. You can apply the derivative in whatever order you want. Uh, so this part is gonna be a partial derivative with respect to volume of the derivative of the free energy with respect to the temperature um, at constant volume. And then this whole thing is gonna be at constant temperature. That is equal to the derivative with respect to the temperature of the derivative of the free energy with respect to uh, the volume at constant temperature. And then this whole thing is at constant volume. So this one over here, derivative of the free energy with respect to the temperature at constant volume is minus the entropy. And we just derived that one. And uh, this one is gonna be minus the pressure. Okay, so if you wanna write it more neatly, because we can get rid of the negative and negative. To write it more neatly, the derivative of the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to volume at constant temperature is equal to the partial derivative of the pressure with respect to temperature at constant volume. So this is equation 3.51. Uh, it is one of the Maxwell relations. So in many uh, thermodynamics books, you will see all the Maxwell relations derived kind of in the same chapter or in the same section. Uh, in Kittel, they just derive them, you know, where, where they are, where they appear. But all of the Maxwell relations um, are a consequence of the uh, commutative property of the um, of the partial derivatives, and I think the the, the take home message from the Maxwell relations is that I guess you can you can convince yourself by taking a bunch of them. Every thermodynamic variable is related to every other thermodynamic variable. So you cannot change one thing in the system without changing everything else in the system. It's a very, um, very well-oiled machine. And you know, it's kind of incredible that nature just solves these um, partial differential equations on the spot, right? We have more trouble solving them. Uh, so, Maxwell, during his life, he was uh, definitely he was definitely famous, and he was famous because of his uh, mostly because of his thermodynamic relations. And after he died, I guess his equations, you know, in um, electromagnetism, became more famous than his relations in thermodynamics, but. It is the same dude. Um, you're definitely one of the of the big names uh, in physics. All right. So We have the definition of, where's my, oh no, that's my blue marker. 
Oh well. I'll grab another one. We have the definition of the free energy. And we know that delta, the change in the free energy with respect to the temperature at constant volume is equal to negative entropy, the negative of the entropy. So we can put the entropy back in here. So the free energy will be, or is, U minus tau derivative of the free energy with respect to tau at constant volume. Um, and there was a negative here, so we have to put the, this one is positive. Okay, so this implies that the energy is equal to the free energy minus the Lannister that Uh, tau change in the free energy with respect to the temperature at constant volume. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this one on this side. I had to find this one. I guess I could have derived it, but I just found it in my favorite book. The derivative uh, of u divided by v with respect to the x is one over v derivative of u. This is not the energy, this is little u. Uh, dx minus u divided by v squared dv dx. And hmm. oh, yeah, this is the favorite book the tables of integrals and everything else. So um, in this case, we can say that u, little u, um, how can I change this u so that it looks different? So it's not the energy. It's equal to f. Uh, v is tau and um, x is also tau, which means that dx is the tau. So now we can write um, this part. So the derivative with respect to tau of the free energy divided by tau is going to be one over tau df uh, d tau minus f divided by tau squared. So this one d tau d tau. So this is just equal to one. So we can get rid of it. Um, so then if we multiply it over here by negative tau squared, derivative with respect to tau of f divided by tau, um, it's gonna be equal to tau squared over tau df d tau minus tau squared f over tau squared. So we can get rid of these tau squares.
and we can get rid of this one too. So this is just tell. Okay. So then this is equal to u. Mm. Mm. Oh, yes, okay. So that is an assumption. So let's say that U has this form. This one is um, equation 3.52. Uh, and now we're going to assume that F divided by tau is equal to a negative of the natural log of the partition function. If that is the case, then minus u over tau squared is negative partial derivative uh, with respect to tau of the natural log of the partition function. So u is tau squared. Mm, These negatives go become positive. A partial derivative of the natural log of z with respect to tau. So it's, it was a little, um, a kind of a meandering approach. So instead of deriving, um, well, now we have this one here, uh, which is the same as this one here. So that means that the free energy is equal to negative tau natural log of the partition function. So it was meandering. They didn't drive it, or I guess Kittel didn't drive it directly. Um, he has the differential equation, um, assumes a form for it, and then uh, proves that uh, that form is equal to what you have for the energy. And so the two quantities have to be the same. So the free energy is equal to that. Um, I guess that was easier than deriving this directly. So uh, this one we derived it before is equation 3.12. And this one is equation 3.55. So this, this is a pretty important equation too. So if you know the partition function, then you can you know the free energy also. If you know the free energy because of the um, because of Maxwell's relations, if you know the free energy, you can derive any thermodynamic quantity that you want about the system. Okay, so that's a powerful statement. If you know the partition function of the system, you know everything, everything about the system. Of course, calculating the partition function is in general pretty tough. 
uh, still, we're going to do it for you know some simple systems. But isn't that amazing? I need validation. Getting really excited and nobody says anything. <laughs> Everything you want to know, it's in the partition function. You know, um, volume pressure relationships, um, elastic moduli, heat capacity, um, bulk modulus, you know, compressibility, everything, everything you want to know is in the partition function. Okay, so let's take a look at the ideal gas. Okay, so finally, some application. Uh, a first look. We're going to go over the Ideal gas with increasing, uh, um, increasingly powerful tools throughout the course. So this is a first look of many. So this is on page um, 72 of Kittel and Cromer. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are going to compute the partition function of an ideal gas. This is a very specific ideal gas. Um, it contains only one particle. Is it a gas if it only contains one particle? I guess that's a philosophical question. So, you know, from a macroscopic point of view, you will see your particle just moving around. But this is actually a very small box. So uh, this particle, it's in the quantum regime. Uh, you know, the, the volume of these, box is L cube. So this is actually a particle in a box. So if you remember the particle in a box, have you seen particle in a box in your like uh, modern physics or quantum? Uh, yes. Okay, good. So this atom has a mass M, I'm gonna put it over here, capital M. Uh, the volume of the box is L cubed. L is the side of the box. Um, this particle is free. So it's a free particle. What that means is that the potential energy over here is zero. Um, how should I call it? Um, let's call it, oh, I'm already using V. Let's just call it U equals zero. Um, I don't know, P equals zero. And this is just, we know that there's no potential energy over here. Um, it only has kinetic energy. But over here, the potential, so actually I should not draw it, the potential is uh, infinite, right? So it, it cannot escape from this, from this L. Is you have your, your, your particle in there. <clears throat> so um, the weight functions that it's gonna have and they look like this, or maybe like that. So you know, just a quick reminder, we're not going to solve this equation here, but it's not that hard to solve. Um, Schrodinger equation. minus h bar squared divided by 2m. And then the second derivative, um, well, the gradient, I guess. No, not the gradient, the, what is this one called, Laplacian? Anyways, 
the kinetic energy operator. Um, we don't have anything in the potential part. So this is just equal to the energy levels of the system times the wave function, right? So this is Schrodinger's equation. And the solution to this differential equation is, you know, in three in three dimensions. Some normalization constant sine of um, yes nx i x divided by l uh, sine of n y i y divided by l sine of n z pi z divided by l so this is the wave function well i guess it was there So you know the boundary conditions require that uh, the wave function is zero at the edges, so at zero and at l, and you can see that uh, this satisfies that. So sat satisfies that if n x n y and n z are integers. Right, at least one of them has to be non-zero, otherwise the wave function will collapse, uh, which cannot happen in this particle in a box. So this is equation 3.58. Question? So Professor, the particle has a weight of a particle. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I guess a simple case that you can think about is uh, if you're in this minimum energy state, which is just like half a sine function, a sine wave, um, you have that in every dimension and it's gonna look a little bit you know, like a sphere. Um, as you move in, in energy, the, the frequency has to increase to accommodate that energy and you know, it might look a little different, it's still going to look somehow uh, somewhat um, spherical, but you'll have more structure. But yes, this, this is a three-dimensional uh, wave function. Okay, so whoa, I guess let's move very quickly. <laughs> The energy levels are given by h bar square over 2m pi over l, and this one is squared. And then you have uh, nx, uh, sorry, nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared energy levels, uh, wave function. So as you put energy in there, um, the number of nodes increases. This particular uh, particle has no more structure than this. So if you look at real atoms, you know, they're gonna have spin up, spin down, uh, orbitals, you know, S, D, F orbitals. Uh, this is a very simple particle in a box. Okay, so let's calculate the partition function. The partition function, the definition is the sum, actually let me, should write a little smaller. Got too excited. That is the definition. So 
the state of this particular, and we call, we're gonna call this one Z1 because it's a partition function for one particle. Uh, we know the state uh, N, X and Y from zero to infinity. So it's gonna be equal to sum over N, X, sum over N, Y, sum over N, Z, then the exponent, and we have the energy levels, minus h bar squared, um, pi squared, and then the n x squared plus n y squared plus n z squared. And that is divided by two, M L uh, L squared, you know, it comes from the energy levels, uh, tau. So tau is this tau over here. So we're just following the definition of the partition function. If the temperature is high enough, then the energy levels are gonna be comparatively, you know, the, the difference between energy levels is gonna be very tiny. And so we can uh, replace the sum by an integral. So it's gonna be from zero to infinity, dn x from zero to infinity, dn y from zero to infinity, dn z. And then we have the exponential. And we're going to use alpha squared to represent these numbers over here, just to make it a little easier. And then we have the nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared. Okay. So uh, alpha um, squared, the definition is h bar squared i squared divided by two m l squared tau. So all these factors. Okay, so the exponents over here, they are being uh, added. So that means that I'm gonna move to, I'm gonna move up here. I'm, I'm gonna continue up here. Uh, this is gonna be equal to e to the negative alpha squared nx squared times e to the negative alpha squared ny squared times e to the negative alpha squared nz squared. Okay, um, we still have this integral, but it's the same you know, for, for all of them. So essentially we can just say that um, I guess I'm gonna put this one dn, dn dy dz integral. Uh, this is gonna be equal to integral from zero to infinity um, dn x, it is the same in every direction exponent of negative alpha squared and x squared. And this whole thing is cubed because we have three of them. Okay, so if we let um, alpha squared and x squared be equal to x squared, then dx is gonna be, um, dx over alpha is gonna be dn. I'm skipping a few steps. So we can rewrite this integral as, 
you know, in terms of x, one over alpha cubed integral from zero to infinity of the x exponent of negative x squared. And this whole thing is cubed. So we saw this integral before. Um, the derivation, I guess the solution is in Tell and Cromer equation A4. Okay, so go to the appendix. But we saw it before, and this looks ugly. A4. The solution to that is going to be one over alpha cubed, one half of pi to the one half. This is the solution. Um, if you do from negative infinity to infinity, then it is uh, square root of pi. But here it goes from zero to infinity, so it's one half of that. And this is cubed. So the whole thing is equal to pi to the three halves divided by eight alpha cubed. Okay, so we're getting we're getting there. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip the algebra, but we know what alpha is. So, well, I'll put a step in there. It's going to be two. to the three halves, m to the three halves, volume. So L cubed is volume, tau to the three halves, pi to the three halves, divided by two to the cube, h bar cubed and pi cubed. So this whole thing is gonna be volume divided by two pi h bar squared divided by mass times the temperature to the three halves. And we're going to introduce this quantity. We can discuss next time what it means. It's called the quantum concentration. So the definition of the quantum concentration is um, m tau divided by two pi h bar squared to the three halves. So then the partition function is going to be um, n q, so this thing times the volume. And another definition, n is going to be 1 over volume. So this is a concentration, a regular concentration. Um, I like to call it particle density. So there's no mass in here, but it is uh, density. So then they'll be equal to the quantum concentration divided by the particle concentration, okay? So this is equation 3.62, okay? So we can derive the partition function analytically in the case of a uh, ideal gas with one particle. 
in a box. So that's, that's pretty cool. And if you give me five more minutes, let's do that. We're gonna derive the, the energy. Anybody remembers the energy of an ideal gas? As a function of the temperature? K. Uh -huh. let's, let's check. So prediction. So the uh, expectation uh, value of the energy, which is in large systems, large enough systems, just the energy, is tau squared derivative with respect to tau natural log of the partition function. We derived this one last time. Okay, so we know the partition function. So this is gonna be natural log of NQ divided by N. So that's gonna be natural log of NQ minus natural log of N. But N is just the volume and doesn't depend on the on temperature. So we can forget about it. So this is tau squared derivative with respect to tau, natural log. We have the quantum concentration. So m tau over two pi h bar. This is to the three halves. So we can take the three halves uh, outside of the log. So this is tau squared derivative with respect to tau. Three halves natural log of some stuff that I'm just gonna call gamma and then this temperature dependence that we care about because we're taking the derivative with respect to the temperature. So uh, U is tau squared, three halves derivative with respect to tau of the natural log of gamma plus the natural log, um, of tau. Gamma is everything else that is not tau, so we can forget about it. Okay, derivative of the natural log of tau with respect to tau is equal to one over tau. So this is gonna be three tau squared divided by two. Um, tau. So we get rid of this one, we get rid of this one. And so this is it, three halves of tau. So remember that we're using the fundamental temperature, but the, I guess the conventional temperature is Kb T. So this is equal to three halves of Kb T. What happened to the N? That's right. So it works. Nice, huh? Very pretty, if you ask me. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording and